Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church, and it is day number 241. And that brings us to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and for all that we learn from what you have done in the lives of your people over the ages. Father, teach us from your word today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea, as the Lord had told me. And for many days we traveled around Mount Seir. Then the Lord said to me, You have been traveling around this mountain country long enough. Turn northward and command the people you are about to pass through the territory of your brothers, the people of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. So be very careful. Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as for the sole of the foot to tread on, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall purchase food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. So we went on away from our brothers, the people of Esau, who live in Seir, away from the Arabah road, from Elath and Ezion Geber. And we turned and went in the direction of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land for a possession, because I have given Ar to the people of Lot for a possession. The Emim formerly lived there, a people great and many, as tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they are also counted as Rephaim, but the Moabites call them Emim. The Horites also lived in Seir formerly, but the people of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave to them. Now rise and go over the brook Zered. So we went over the brook Zered. And the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was 38 years, until the entire generation, that is the men of war, had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. For indeed, the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the camp until they perished. So, as soon as all of the men of war had perished and were dead from among the people, the Lord said to me, Today you are to cross the border of Moab at Ar, and when you approach the territory of the people of Ammon, do not harass them or contend with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot for a possession. It is also counted as a land of Rephaim. Rephaim formerly lived there, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim, a people great and many, as tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before the Ammonites, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place, as he did for the people of Esau who live in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place even to this day. As for the Avim, who lived in the villages as far as Geza, the Kaphtorim, who came from Kaphtor, destroyed them and settled in their place. Rise up, set out on your journey, and go over the valley of the Arnon. Behold, I have given into your hand Sihon, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to take possession and contend with him in battle. This day I will begin to put the f- dread and fear of you on the peoples who are under the whole heaven, who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. So I sent messengers <clears throat> from the wilderness of Kedemoth to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, Let me pass through your land. I will only go by the road. I will turn aside neither to the right nor to the left. You shall sell me food for money that I may eat and give me water for money that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot as the sons of Esau who live in Seir and the Moabites who live in Ar did for me 
until I go over the Jordan into the land that the Lord our God is giving us. But Sihon the king of Heshbon would not let us pass by him, for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate, that he might give him into your hand as he is this day. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have begun to give Sihon and his land over to you. Begin to take possession, that you may occupy his land. Then Sihon came out against us, and he and his people to battle at Jahaz. And the Lord our God gave him over to us, and we defeated him and his sons and all his people. And we captured all his cities at that time, and devoted to destruction every city, men, women, and children, we left no survivors. Only the livestock we took as spoils for ourselves with the plunder of the cities that we captured. From Aror, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, and from the city that is in the valley as far as Gilead, there was not a city too high for us. The Lord our God gave all into our hands. Only to the land of the sons of Ammon you did not draw near. That is, to all the banks of the river Jabbok and the cities of the hill country, whatever the Lord our God had forbidden us. That's Deuteronomy chapter 2. And again, just to remind you of where we are in the structure of Deuteronomy, we're in this historical prologue section. There's a retelling of this history with a purpose. And the purpose here is very clear. If you obey God, if you follow his voice and you do what he tells you to do, you will be successful. God will take care of you. He will lead you in the way you should go. But if you rebel against his word, if you refuse to submit to him, you will find hardship and trouble and defeat await you. So it's a very much a call to obey the Lord. And it's a setup for the giving of the law, which is going to come improper in, from the end of chapter 4 through the end of chapter 11. But this is all background that's letting the people see the importance of hearing and obeying the word of the Lord. <clears throat> now here he's talking about uh, after they had been defeated from their attempt to take the promised land by force without God's blessing, and they stayed down um, around the Mount Seir area for a long time. Um, the, the, the Red Sea, uh, Red Sea direction is sort of down in the southern part of that peninsula, the Sinai Peninsula, but not all the way down on the peninsula, but just sort of in the desert area that's south of the Dead Sea, south of, of Israel. <clears throat> that's kind of where they stayed for a long time. And then all of a sudden we've kind of fast forwarded many, many years because the spies going up into the land and coming back, that was in the second year after coming out of Egypt. And, and their attempt to take it, that's getting us toward the end of this second year after they come out of Egypt. But now here we are 40 years later when they're moving, 38 years later, it's the 40th year after they've come out, and they're moving finally to the east side of the Dead Sea and the east side of the Jordan. And again, where God protects them from conflict because he's assigned areas for these different sons of Abraham to live or sons of Lot to live, God keeps them from those battles. And he tells them, you know, don't harass Esau, don't harass Moab, um, give an Esau to the sons, uh, to, I've given Mount Seir area, Edom to the sons of Esau. I've given uh, the Moabite area to the sons of Lot. And so don't mess with them, pay them for everything that you eat or drink stay on the road, don't interact with them. That's their place. So this is part of what we need to learn from this is contentment, right? Yesterday in church for our sermon, we were talking about coveting and contentment. It would have been easy for the Israelites to walk by and see the land that the Edomites had or see the land that uh, the Moabites had and to covet that land as a place where maybe they could settle down, maybe they could rest because They've been traveling in this desert wilderness for 40 years, but this was not their place. It was the place that God had assigned for others. So they needed to be content. And then they meet their first opponent, 
where God tells them, you are going to be able to go to war with this guy and you're going to be able to beat him. And this is uh, Heshbon, um, Sihon, the king of Heshbon. So they go out and they defeat and they get uh, the territory from Sihon, the king of Heshbon, because that's what God had told them to do. And God tells them exactly what to do with the things that he gives into their hand, and they obey that. So they're starting to learn, after the disobedience of chapter 1, they're starting to learn the fruitfulness of obedience in chapter 2. Now, sometimes as Christians, we can hear well-meaning people who emphasize the gospel of grace and the truth that we are not saved by our own obedience, which is absolutely true, and that, you know, God doesn't bless us or curse us based upon our obedience, but based upon Christ's obedience, which is absolutely true. But then those very same people will act as if it doesn't matter if you obey or disobey God. It's like, well, you should obey God because it's the right thing to do. And uh, you should be grateful for all that God's done for you. But if you disobey God, it really doesn't make any difference. And I think they're well-meaning because they're trying to keep us away from a works righteousness mentality that says, I'm having a bad day because I disobeyed the Lord. Or I'm having a good day because I'm such a good person and I've pleased the Lord so greatly in my life. We can get trapped in that kind of works righteousness mentality and think, well, I better wake up early and spend some time in the Bible and spend some time praying so that I can have a really good day. Is there a problem with that? There's a huge problem with that. Because now we're trying to manipulate God and use him as a means to getting what we really want, which is a really good day, as we would define it. That is a day that's smooth and easy and profitable and free from strife. That's a wrong, wrong, wrong way to approach the Lord. And so I understand people who are wanting us to stay out of that trap. We can also have false guilt and shame if we're having a really difficult day, we're really struggling, things are hard for us, and we think, oh, it's because I didn't read my Bible and pray this morning because I didn't spend time with the Lord. Therefore, God is angry at me and he's sort of, you know, punishing me. We need to avoid that trap. However, avoiding that trap, we can still say it is good to obey the Lord and that God does bless obedience. Now, he doesn't bless it necessarily in the way we always see like, we want to be wealthy, we want to be successful, we want to be healthy, we want all these worldly measures of success. But rather, he accomplishes his purpose through us when we are obedient to his word and we follow his spirit. And when we're disobedient, the Lord often does discipline us as a father disciplines a son he loves and often will set us aside from being used for particular purposes because we're not being obedient to him, we're not giving him the glory we're not walking in close fellowship with him. So again, don't take it in a works righteousness direction and don't look at it from an earthly perspective. Don't take that lie that says, if you are a good Christian, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous and successful in all the worldly measures. And if you're having a bad day, it's because God's mad at you. Don't, don't go down that road. But do understand and appreciate the truth that it is right and good to obey the Lord. That just because we're saved by grace doesn't mean we don't pursue good works. We're saved by grace, Ephesians 2 would say, and verse 10 would say we're saved for good works that God's prepared beforehand for us to walk in them. So we walk in the way that God's prepared because he is so gracious to us and because we love him and because we want to be used for his purposes in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness and our peace. He's the only one who was perfectly obedient, and his perfect obedience is our salvation. Help us to walk in obedience to you, in loving imitation of Christ, and in joyful response to your grace to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today for Deuteronomy chapter 2. Hope you have a blessed day in the Lord.